Hello, listeners. Been wondering how you can help the show? Probably not. But here are five things you can do. One, subscribe. Support the show by clicking the subscription link in the show notes. Two, review on iTunes, on our website, www.afraidofnothingpodcast.com, or on whatever app you listen to. Three, donate. When you go to our website, click the cute coffee cup icon. Or in the show notes, click the subscription link. Four, share. Sharing really is caring. Tell your friends and even your enemies to check out the show. Five, watch. Wait a minute. It's a podcast, not a movie. Actually, it's both. Check the show notes to find out where to watch the documentary. You can also rent it on Prime Video. That's it. Oh, one last thing. Enjoy this episode. Good evening, cats and gals. We're rocking and rolling at W-A-O-N. This next little ditty is by the Evil Streaks from their album, Talk to the Dead. It's called, What Does Franny Know? And we're going to dedicate this to Annabelle. Because, well, you should never touch that board. known. Nothing is certain. Reality is not real. Wake up! Be afraid of nothing. I'm Bob Heskey. Robert. The host with the ghost. This is my podcast, based on my paranormal documentary, Afraid of Nothing. Each episode, we talk to people who see life and the afterlife through a different lens. Join me. Who is this large man? And what's he doing in our bedroom? As we lift the veil and open our minds to see beyond our eyes lie. This is Afraid of Nothing. Okay, I'm here in Salem, Massachusetts, right after Halloween, and it is humming on the streets here. There's a lot of activity. You would think with the pandemic, things might have slowed down. Maybe it did on Halloween, but people are back on a beautiful Saturday. So, John, welcome to the show, and why don't you introduce yourselves to our uh, listeners? Hi, Bob. Thanks so much for having me. My name is John Kozik. I'm not only the owner of the Salem Witchboard Museum here in downtown Salem, I'm also the treasurer for the Talking Board Historical Society, and we're a registered nonprofit who research, preserve, and celebrate the history of talking boards. Excellent. Now, you were in my documentary, Afraid of Nothing. You, uh, there was a talking board that, at the time, you had donated uh, certain boards that might have been cursed to, you, to the Magic Parlor. You don't do that now. You actually save them here, and you're going to bring them to a paracon, which you're going to talk about. At that time, you would come in and you had shared a bunch of your boards as a personal collector. So let's start with you as a personal collector, how you got into it and some of your best, most prized boards that you have. So I got interested in talking boards because I inherited my grandmother's board. When I went online to learn more about that board, I basically realized that the board, the talking board didn't just look one way that I always thought it did. There was hundreds, if not thousands of different boards. As I delved into the history, not only, you know, the spooky Halloween kind of ghost stories behind the boards, but also the the history of family feuds of 100 years and women kind of being written out of history and presidential history, all these different layers that really just interested me and wanted me to, I wanted to learn as much as I possibly could about it. And so much so that as a collector, I did that for about 15 years until luckily I was able to find a space in Salem to open this museum and now share not only what I know, but uh, the collection as well. So is this mostly your personal collection? Are there any other Ouija boards that people have donated as well for, for to be on exhibit? So everything here is from my collection. There are three boards that were donated to the Talking Board Historical Society. 
those three boards have backstories of uh, previous owners having problem with those boards. All right, let's talk about the macabre a little bit. So when you say backstory, people who, let's talk about each of them, if you don't mind. There's sure. three of them. So how, do, how does a person contact you and send you a board, and, and how does it end up in this museum? Well, I think there's a lot of superstitions out there. People have. They've heard stories about boards. So sometimes it's as simple as they bought a new house, and they found this board there, and they just don't know what to do with it. Not that they had a, an experience with the board, just they don't feel comfortable being around the board. Other times, it's that people have used the board, had a bad experience with it, and now they're afraid that they've opened the door and can't shut it. And so being a member of the Talking Board Historical Society, uh, we have a, a web presence where people would seek us out you know, and ask us how, what to do with these boards. So in my experience is, uh, no matter what the, the worst case is that people have had, when the board is out of sight, out of mind, the problems tend to go away. So, you know, we accept those boards as donations. And uh, the three that have, have come here aren't necessarily the most, the craziest stories you've ever heard about people using the Ouija board, but they really help tell different stories that are here. And that's really how this museum is curated. It's not to show the rarest or the most valuable boards. It's really to tell the most amount of stories. So, so oh, yeah, so I was going to say, look, if you're... It's wish I could show it because it's a beautiful. It's in the back of the Remember Salem yep. store on Essex Street, 127 Essex Street in Salem. If you, if you come down this way, you go in the back and it's literally a kind of L-shaped area, which is just adorned with the most amazing kind of variety of talking boards and posters and historic things and, and whatnot. But, you know, on the wall, naturally being kind of a paranormal intrigue guy, I noticed three that had caution tape. One of them you mentioned, it just kind of showed up in the house, correct? They didn't know how it got there? Correct. Those two with the caution tape, they, they, you can notice them as soon as you come in the museum, they have caution tape put across them. And uh, the previous owner of those boards found them in their house. They're not sure how they got in their house. But when they found them in the house, the husband, started, uh, the husband lost his job and the kids, they started suffering from nightmares. So the wife, she put the caution tape on the board to protect anybody from actually using them. They donated them to the Talking Board Historical Society. And when I followed up with them after I received them, uh, the husband had a new job, and the kids stopped having nightmares. So she believed just having them in her house, not using them, just having them in her house caused those problems. The problems went away when the boards went away. Wow, and, and you, I mean, look, historically, before this museum, even with the Talking Board Historical Society, which we'll talk about in a minute, you have gotten boards with kind of a history, but you've, I remember when I interviewed you several years ago, they don't seem to affect you too much. You've never had a bad kind of encounter with that, correct? No, correct. Uh, you know, prior to the museum, all these boards were in my house. Uh, taking them from the TBHS, any donations, those who were in my house. Nothing strange, nothing bad ever happened there. Uh, nothing happens to me here in the museum. I do have a lot of guests who come in. First of all, there's a lot of guests who can't come in this room. So many people come to a Harry Potter store and they don't realize this is here in the back. And when they look through the archway and see the boards on the wall, they say Ouija boards and they leave. A lot of people come back by themselves because the person they're traveling with, taking a vacation with, are uncomfortable coming in this room. Some people come back here and they hold their chest and they say, I don't feel good or bad, I just feel heavy being in this room. I have had two people come in and shiver and shake in the middle of the floor and not want to go near the walls. So, you know, people's reaction to these boards, you know, people do put a lot of power into them. Yeah, yeah. I want to, you, now, you remember uh, the board you donated to the Magic Parlor. I bought, it, it, was, in, I, it was in the trunk of my car for months because my uh, wife, ex-wife, you know, now, wife at the time, would not let me bring it into the house. You were there. We had a shaman come in. He was a bit dramatic. Some people believe it. Some people don't. But I don't know if you know the kind of backstory of what happened after that, uh, with that board. Were you familiar? Did anyone ever tell you? No. Or? Okay. So I drove around with it in my car for several months, and I started getting a bunch of EVPs you know, coming through my radio. So as an example, I would drive to work. Usually I had the FM sta station on. I put AM on for some reason, and I went in the garage, and I drove into the garage around the corners up to the top where you could kind of sneak and park for free. And I started getting these weird kind of demonic almost sounds, right? And after a couple of days, I, I never had that problem. I never had it on AM. And so I started repeating it. And finally, I recorded it, and I sent it to Mike Markowitz, who was the EVP specialist in the film. I don't know if you, actually, you get to see oh, yeah, that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yes. Yep. And so some of those EVPs that you hear are basically after I had that board in my trunk, you oh, know, wow. um, were hiding me. And there was, you know, a, there were a couple other ones, too. And so that stuff started happening pretty regularly. And I just kind of just uh, I gave the board to a witch 
And, you know, they've had no problems with it, you know, since then. I mean, I know Rob, after a couple weeks after, there were a couple things flying off the shelf a little bit that he thought on security camera, we couldn't quite connect it. But yeah, and then I had this weird type of experience. Uh, I've said this so people have listened to the podcast. I was in bed, again, facing my ex-wife at the time. She was asleep, and I literally felt my rib cage open, like as if someone reverse punched me in the stomach. Like it opened, and I felt something leap out of me. And it was one of those moments you're like, did that just happen? I'm awake. I'm wide yeah. awake. I'm not falling asleep, you know? And it just felt like something fled away from me. My first thought was, is this my soul? I was like freaked out, or is this like some entity or whatever? One of the things, too, on one of the EVPs I got after that uh, session was I used to always start my day with positive you know, uh, affirmations. You know, I used to, religious aspect, I thank the Lord my God, blah, 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 blah. And one of the EVPs, you might remember from the documentary, was F God. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I thought at the time, wow, because every day in the car, I'd, do, I'd start my day with and my commute with my, my affirmation, my positive affirmation. So who knows if that's connected or not? Sure. You know, who knows? I know, I know it seemed kind of weird when the shaman was there and he was kind of shaking the board and releasing stuff and uh, he felt stuff there. But personally, and a person, you know, when we were there that day, the, the sound cut out, you oh, know, I remember. remember that, the boom yep. mic, it oh, cut yeah. out, it was going into the, it was going into the receiver or whatever, but it wasn't going out. There was some weird stuff that happened. And so after the fact too, and then I got rid of the board and they've had no experience with it. It's okay. So you never know with these Ouija boards, it may affect some people some way and others another, or, or who Absolutely. knows? <laughs> it's, nope. it's funny how that goes. You know, some people like myself, I don't feel anything being in the room. But then I have, like I said, I have people who come in here and shiver and shake, and they do definitely have a reaction to being around them. Yeah, and now let's talk about the history of the Ouija board, if you don't mind, kind sure. of where the name came from, and who's the first person that patented it, who's the person that got the name, that sort of good stuff. Well, I think, you know, to start the story, a lot of people are, are kind of don't realize that there's no inventor of these boards. These come about because the spiritualist movement in Ohio at the time, the mid-1800s, People are channeling spirits that they are claiming knock, that are knocking responses back to them. So originally, there's a lot of yes and no questions, and eventually, uh, you know, they're having to count how many knocks to figure out what letter of the alphabet that they're on. So to speed that conversation up, they just introduce an alphabet board where they point to the letters, wait for the knocks. Eventually, someone takes an automatic writing planchette, which is a planchette very similar to any of the ones you're used to seeing here. The only difference has a pencil at the front of it. And a medium would channel a spirit through themselves, and they would write or draw onto a piece of paper whatever comes through. That device existed in France as early as 1848, and it kind of crossed paths with an alphabet board. And that's where we get a talking board. Wow. So everything from 1850 to 1890 is homemade. And um, in 1890 is when Charles Kennard has the idea to produce a board. He doesn't have a name for it, doesn't even have a factory. So he actually goes to a local coffin maker and produces a board that he starts selling, calling it a witch board. And he does that for a few months until uh, one night, Helen Peters, she uses the board and she asks the board what it wants to be called. And the board spells back Ouija. She asks, what does it mean? And the board spells back good luck. So the board names itself. Wow, that's and a good so, start. You know, a lot of the history in the museum is if you tell the story long enough, it becomes the truth. Well, Helen, for instance, we only found out uh, her story seven years ago. She basically gets written out of history. You know, now we can finally retell the story. You know, manufacturers eventually would say they, they claim to be the inventor, which is not true, yeah. or that it means German and French for yes, yes, or the Egyptian good luck board, all these different things, just to help sell it and make it seem older than it really is. But it's not. It's uh, defining a talking board as an alphabet board with a small table planchette that is spelled to letters. Uh, that is very American, and it's about mid 1800s. Now, who was Helen Peters? Was she an older woman who was, had some money? Was she married? To, did she work? Any, any backstory about who she was? Or? So, first of all, she's the sister-in-law to Elijah Bond. Elijah Bond is the person that actually had the patent assigned to him. Okay. But she's the sister-in-law to him, and the two of them went to the patent office, where clerk after clerk, no one would sign off on the patent, until finally the chief patent clerk says, I don't know you, you don't know me, tell me my name and I'll give you the patent. Helen was a strong medium. Uh, she used the board, told him his name, and that's really how they secured the patent. Wow, so she was a medium. I didn't even yeah. I didn't know that. That's great. Wow, excellent. Yeah. Eventually, you know, she gets written out of history, not only, I think, because male manufacturers don't want to include her. You know, they want to say they invented the board or things like that. Yeah. Okay, for the past 10 or so seconds as I've been playing this back, I've been hearing an echoey voice in the background, and it doesn't sound like a customer. And so finally, on this last take, you'll hear what sounds like, thank you. So listen and let me know what you think, and then we'll get back to the interview. 
thing like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so you heard me amplify it and uh, let me know. Now back to the interview. But also she had a bad experience with the Ouija board. Um, and so she ended up turning her back on it and moving away. Her and her husband moved away. Do, do you know what that experience was? or does I, that... I do. So her family owned property where there was uh, Civil War battles. Uh-huh. And her family used to collect the buttons off of the dead soldiers' uniforms. And so it was kind of a prized possession, this, this, this uh, jar of buttons. Well, anyways, it goes missing one day. And so Helen asks the board what happened to these buttons. And the board tells her that a, another family member had taken it. Now, she didn't believe the board. She didn't believe the board, but other family members did. And it actually caused a big rift between the family, so much so that, uh, yeah, she, she, her and her husband moved out to Denver, Colorado to get away from the rest of the family. Wow. Where did she live at the time? Where, did, what state did she live in? When? Back then, it, where, where it was named and patented, she was in Baltimore. Chestertown Baltimore, and Baltimore right. was, was the, the area. Okay. Wow. And, and how has this museum been doing since you opened it up? It's been great. I think it's going over really well. Uh, I was fortunate enough, about three years ago, I did an exhibit at the Satanic Temple here in Salem. Yeah. And uh, it was only supposed to be like a month-long, uh, it was a lecture and a month-long display that ended up staying up for three months. And it was very successful there. And it kind of showed me that there was interest in this type of thing maybe being more permanent in Salem. Yeah. And so that was really the idea be- you know, behind opening a museum. Yep. But uh, I-, I couldn't be happier. I love the space I have. I love the- who I'm working you know, connected with, with Remember Salem, Tim, who uh, owns the Halloween Museum. And Tim whatnot. McGuire, yep, yep, he was in the, uh, now he's, he has Remember, Remember Salem, and it was, it was the Why Not shop? Is yep, that, the yep. Wands shop next door. Yep, and uh, he's also a, uh, he's a medium too, correct? He was in my film. He's, a, he's, he, in, he's in your film, I don't know if he would ca- claim to be, a, he would say he has, um, he can feel things. Yeah. I don't know if he would say he's a, a medium in the sense that, like, he could read things for you, yeah. but I think he definitely has uh he definitely is able to uh, get sensations and, and feelings. Yeah, he's had some weird stuff happen in the basement oh, yeah. of the of the wand shop where yep. he won't go down there alone. I mean, I remember he mentioned that. He's also a great historian, one of probably the better historians you're going to come across for our Salem as well. So, yeah. So, yeah, excellent. Yeah, and I got to tell you, I was so happy when I drove down here and the, the traffic and the foot traffic outside blew my mind. I thought after, like, Salem was kind of shut down, you know, for Halloween... It would be a little bit of a ghost town, uh, no pun intended, but uh, not at all. There's a lot of people out milling about and having a good time today in this beautiful weather, which is great. And it happens again. You'll hear a voice say, not bad, (laughs) in the background. Beautiful weather, which is great. Beautiful weather, which is great. Beautiful weather, which is great. Yeah, I think, you know, with the city put in the, the restrictions for, you know, curfews and whatnot, that the people that did stay away just stayed away until those curfews were lifted. And so uh, weekend after Halloween, I think people are back, and uh, I think November is going to be pretty busy. Hey, everybody. This is your paranormal podcast pal, Bob Heskey. You know, every night I like to listen to videos on YouTube. But lately, with COVID, civil unrest, market volatility, politics, conspiracy theories, I just want to tune out. That's why I like Audible. What's Audible, you say? Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audio books, including some great horror and paranormal titles like A Head Full of Ghosts by Paul Tremblay, If It Bleeds by Stephen King, and The Boatman's Daughter by Andy Davidson. This place is cursed. Each month, members get one credit to pick any title, plus two Audible Originals from a monthly selection. Access to daily news digests, if you actually want to hear the news, as well as guided meditation programs. Hey, we all need a little zen now and again. And Audible is oh so easy. You can download titles and listen offline, anytime, anywhere, on any device. The app is free and can be installed in your smartphone or tablet. You can even listen across devices without losing your spot. How cool is that? If you can't decide what to listen to, no problem. You can keep your credits for up to a year and binge on your favorite series later on. So, here's the rub. The Afraid of Nothing podcast is stoked to partner with the audio bookworms at Audible to offer you a free 30-day trial membership. Just follow the link in the show notes, audibletrial.com forward slash AON Podcast. Puedes repetir eso, por favor. 
That's audibletrial.com forward slash AON, all caps, podcast, lowercase. Full disclosure, I get a commission for everyone who signs up using that URL. But you get to try it for 30 days without a commitment. Using our custom URL doesn't cost you a penny and helps out the show if you do sign up. Nothing scary about that. So escape reality and pick up a book, an audio book, and listen to what's out there. Go to audibletrial.com forward slash AON podcast after listening to the show. Okay, now looking around this room, I mean, you could totally be mesmerized by all these boards on the wall. What are, give us uh, two or three that are near and dear to your heart that you would uh, show someone if they walked in here. To me, one of my favorite boards in the museum is called the Electric Mystifying Oracle. It's made in the 1930s, and it's a metal talking board. The planchette that came with it was metal, had ball bearing casters and a battery inside of it. And on the board, there's these slight little bumps, and when the planchette would hit them, it would actually light up the planchette. Uh, wow. With, with that. And uh, the, the company put all their capital into producing it, and it was a flop. Really? Uh, people loved it. They sent their salespeople out to demonstrate it. But in 1933, during the Depression, nobody Right before the war, right? right. Exactly. So it was a higher price board. Metal they wanted $5 yeah, yeah. for it, yep. as opposed to a regular board sold for about $1.50. And so a couple of years later, World War II comes along, and they scrap them for the oh, war effort. Oh, God. Today, we know of seven boards and only three planchettes that still exist. And you have one of the seven boards over here. Yeah. You don't have a planchette, but you know who has the three planchettes. And I do. I know where the seven point. boards are, and uh, hopefully at some point, someone will want to help me get it in the museum because I tell that story so often every day. Yeah. It's one of many stories I tell, but that one in particular. And uh, it would be a good addition to, you know, a visual to go along with those stories. Now, what would be, look, it, it's a, a, a value is subjective, but what would be a value of a board with the planchette like that? What do you think that would be? It's almost impossible to tell you, Bob. To be yeah. honest with you, it's not that I'm avoiding the question, yep. but I can tell you that how do you value something that has never sold online before? Yeah, yeah. There's nothing to compare it to. The only way to compare it is to pretty much profile all the other collectors. You have to know what people have in their collection, what they're missing from their collection, what the last thing they bought was, did they overpay for it. There's a lot of factors into figuring out who might come up with what money and what time it is. But for me, I can tell you that board I wanted it so badly when it came up for sale, I hopped in my car pretty much with no hesitation and drove straight to, picked up my friend Robert Merch, yeah. and we drove straight to Florida nonstop to get that board. Wow. And we should talk about Robert Merch for a quick second. He's like the godfather of, of collecting Ouija boards, isn't he? He really kind of, is, yeah, yeah. He really is the, the world historian when it comes to talking boards. He's been doing this for 30 years. And his research is really how we know Helen's story. Yeah. A lot of these stories, it's through his, his actual research doing it. I originally, when I was doing the documentary, I, I reached out to him. He was moving to Denver, Colorado, and he mentioned you, which I'm glad he did, actually. Oh. And uh, he's had a little bit of some issues with some pain management, I think. We're, we're wishing him well. How's, how's he doing? Have you talked to him recently? Or? I talked to him just about every day. I haven't talked to him yet today, but I talked to him every day, which is wonderful. He's my best friend. He's had a, a back surgery, a, a very short story of back surgery with a lot of complications. It's been a very long road uh, of recovery from those operations. But yeah. the last couple months, he's been doing really well, and it's so great to, to have him back because when he lived here in Boston, I was very lucky and fortunate to be able to see him on a very regular basis. And now that he's halfway across the country, I can only talk to him. I only get to go out there a couple times a year. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, people like him are kind of probably, they're unsung heroes, you know, things like this. You know, this is a this is a great part of Americana and of Salem history. Yeah. And if it wasn't for him, you know, people it, wouldn't know a fifth of what they probably know about these He shares books. everything he learns, yeah. what I love. You know, he's not a collector who hoards things aside and just like, it's me, me, me. He really is one of the most generous people you'll ever meet. He shares all that information that, that he gets. Whatever he knows, I could know. You yeah, know, yeah. is he shares that. And uh, he really is a mentor to me. He's a guy that has really made me want to be a better person because of uh, just how he's cultivated uh, a very unique uh, group of collectors, which most collectors in other types of uh, worlds usually fight against each other and try to outdo each other and backstab and yeah. get the item they want. And really, he showed that the friendships you have because of this is way more important than the actual object these objects i love owning them don't get me wrong yeah and you know but with a group of my friends that i'm happy for them if i can't get something 
I'm very happy uh, they're able to add something to their collection. Uh, and so, you know, he's made that a, a much better environment to be around, a very supportive environment, whereas coming from collecting other things before Ouija, uh, we're very opposite. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, and, I, and look, I, it was only probably a couple of emails I had with him, but the sense I got was he considered you a protege almost and really yep. wanted to elevate you, and what you've done, you know, you've blossomed with this museum, so congratulations. Two other boards you want to talk about in here that you'd point out? Uh, uh, one, we're sitting in this room right here, which is kind of, I call it the seance room. It's got a couch and it's kind of Victorian feel to it. And there's another donated board in this room. It's actually the Stranger Things board. <laughs> and a lot of people think it's, it, it's kind of funny because it's a newer board. But it's here for a few reasons. The first is that people that watch that show might not have realized that when she had the alphabet strung up on the wall, the light bulbs were lighting up the letters, and that, that that was a talking board. Even though there wasn't a planchette, those light bulbs were lighting up the alphabet for her. She was speaking to her son on the other side. The other reason it's here is it changes a lot of people's perceptions as to how old something is to be haunted. Typically, you think something has to be very old to be haunted, not something from 2017. Yeah. But the previous owner of that board had a bad enough experience with it, so much so they spent 15 to $20 to mail it to the Talking Board Historical Society. They didn't put a return address on the package. They only put a note in with the board, and the note basically says, if you find it, forward it to the TBHS, because trust me, you don't want it. Wow. Did you, did you know, like in the um, Lizzie Borden house, did you know the story of the Ouija board I there? Do. Okay, That's cool. great story. Yeah, they, yeah. They, do you want to share it? Because I didn't get that into the film because I had to like, cut stuff sure. out. But, um, yeah, do you want to tell that story? Sure. So they had a Ouija board on display there. It's not, it, wasn't a unique, um, it wasn't original to the house, but it was something that they eventually acquired for there. It's like 1920s, roughly. And uh, at one point, a guest or somebody stole it, took it out of the museum, and just when they thought they would never see it again, it showed up back in the mail with a little note. And the note basically said that, you know, they were sorry for taking it, all these bad things had started happening to them since they had taken the board, and that they wanted to return it back to have the things end. So. Yeah. They didn't have the planchette, right? It was no, just the board. Just yeah? the board, okay. yeah. All right, yeah, okay. Hey, going back to the metal board really quick. The surface, metal versus wood, does that make a difference? I mean, purists, would they also think, you know, metal isn't very, you know, good to the senses and doing the Ouija yeah, versus... I know. I think some people would claim that using a wooden board, there's more of a connection to the earth, yeah. that that board would be better to use than, say, a plastic you yeah. know, or metal board. But metal comes from the earth, too. It's just manufactured, but, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But really, you know, technically, you could take a piece of paper and write out the alphabet on that paper, and it's going to work just as well as something you buy in the store. Because ultimately, the boards work based on what you believe. Yeah. You know, if you have an uneasy feeling or you believe you have to, you know, say a prayer, light a candle, or do anything like that, then those are things you should do to have the best experience possible. Yeah. But ultimately, the boards work based on the user, what they believe. Okay, cool. All right, give us a third board. What's your last one if you had to pick one? Well, my grandmother's board. Here, oh. Uh, that's pretty awesome. That's uh, a typical Ouija board from the 1930s. And that's the one that really set me down the rabbit hole. When I went online to find out more about it, it was like, whoa, uh, that's an obvious. But the one underneath it, I'm in the middle of researching right now, and that is a big blue circle. Yep. And it's from 1970s, and it's called the Mantic Message Mat. And so that particular board comes from the estate of Geraldine Saunders. Uh -huh. Geraldine Saunders was the first female cruise ship director. She wrote a book called The Love Boats, yep. which became the TV show called The Love Boat. <laughs> She was married to uh, Henry Omar, who was an astrologist to the stars. And even though they were only married for a few months, she actually kept writing that column for years. She was engaged to a B-movie actor who was in uh, Hercules vs. the Cyclops. And she found him hanging dead in the shower, bound and gagged, with all these hypodermic needles in his arms, all this derogatory stuff written all over his chest. God. And a very fascinating life. She was a model. But anyway, she passed away just a few years ago. I met the person that bought... Um, Okay, so it happens again, and it's happened a couple times. And look, this is a, a museum. It's in a store. People are milling around. Not a ton of people, but people are there. But the things I'm pointing out are things where I don't actually hear a person in the background. It has that EVP type of sing-song tone. So I don't even know what this one says, but it's, it's, it's kind of a weird thing. But anyways, take a listen, see what you think. And then, uh, yeah, just weird. In this room where it felt really cool, it could be a couple EVPs that we picked up. Who knows? You be the judge. But anyway, she passed away just a few years ago. I met the person that bought, um, I met the person that bought, um, bought, um, bought, um,
all of her occult and astrology book, and uh, he found 13 of those boards there. So that board was never sold in stores. It was really the one here on display. has. And it was 13, the number 13. 13. <laughs> and so uh, I flew out to California, and I basically acquired as many as I could. And uh, that board was never sold in stores. It was only sold on the Pacific Princess, the yeah. Love Boat, whatever you want to call it, whatever wow. cruise liner she worked for. The one here has these little notes that say you got to see the clerk for availability. It's, it's an amazing board. It's one of the largest you'll see, 24 inches. Yeah, it is. Uh, it has like a four leaf clover planchette, plastic planchette with these little indentations for your fingertips to fit in there perfectly. It's beautiful and it, it's one of my favorite boards because I'm in the middle of trying to research it now. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's one of my favorites for sure. Now, a quick question. So, because I know Tim McGuire has had some ghostly things happening in this, in this building and in the one next door. Has anybody reported anything since you've moved the boards in here? Anything or? No, I have not. But I got to tell you, you know, when I was moving things in a year, I've only been open a year. Last year, when before I opened, people were coming in, like neighbors, people that worked here, and I hear all sorts of stories. I hear, you know, the stories that, that he tells you in uh, in the documentary. You know, you start hearing that in the basement over there, people are pushed or touched. They see things. Yeah. Personally, nothing's happened to me. But as you hear hundreds of stories. For me, I get jealous. I'm like, why am I not seeing yeah. anything, you know? Yeah. But you believe it. I, I don't, I, all these Ouija stories I've ever heard, I don't, I've always believed they believe they've experienced whatever they've told me. Okay, cool. You know, I might not believe that, you know, you can use a board and it can start raining in your house, or you, to get rid of a board, you light it on fire and it comes back to you, but I believe they believe. Yeah, I gave you one example that. that happened to me too, so yeah. yeah. Cool. You have to give a person right there. Oh. I'm honestly just listening. Okay. I'm learning. Oh, good. Are you okay just listen? Of course. I'm learning a lot about Ouija boards. I okay. really like it. So, awesome. Okay. <laughs> you want to say something about Ouija being the podcast? We have a customer here right now, and we just want to kind of get her. What's your name? Chandler. Okay. Let's uh, tell us, you know, what brought you here and what your interest is in Ouija boards. Okay. I've always found Ouija boards super interesting. I believe, like, I'm super into afterlife. I love all kinds of. You know, the stories that you hear, and I personally, I don't see, like, shadow figures. I don't see, like, I do have, like, empath, like, connections to things. I'm really good at reading things, or, like, I'm, I can be drawn to something or, like, really put off by things. So coming in here, I just wanted to see how that affected how I felt and kind of, like, if I felt overwhelmed or anything. Honestly, I'm just super excited to be in here. <laughs> So it's just really, really cool. And I think that it's like a thing that a lot of people just don't understand and don't know about. Yeah. And they like get this idea that it's like this evil, horrible thing. But then like there's so much cool history behind yeah. everything. So I like the creepy stuff. So I'm like a horror buff. <laughs> <laughs> so all the creepy stuff you can throw at me, I'm like, I'm ready. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. John, and there's a couple of people I've met that aren't affected by stuff, and they seem to vibrate a little bit of a higher level, if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Like, they're kind of not affected by stuff. He's one. There's another guy named Danny Perez. What was your feeling when you saw the caution tape on the Ouija boards as an empath? Did you, did you pick up anything with that? So that was actually one of the things that caught my eyes. Um, my, in, my instant instinct was I wanted to touch it, but then I was like, I probably shouldn't because that would be a very bad idea. Like, I didn't get any crazy weird feelings but i will tell you um i might be saying this wrong but it's like the the shrek the schneck board i don't know oh the shrek, shrek the shrek board, board. Yep. there's a <laughs> shrek board and when i saw it i had this instant connection with it and then when i saw the planchet to it which yep. is a coffin i was like this just all makes sense why i would be super connected to this board sure. but something about it it's like one thing that just catches my eye and I'm like that's it like this is what I'm drawn to and I would I want to know why but I didn't get super creeped out by yeah. like the caution sure. one I was like real interested in it and then that note over there sure I loved because I'm like all right what happened here you know what I mean <laughs> are you from around here or do you I live in Dallas Texas okay wow so but I got married here um on Halloween at the, oh, nice. so at the witch memorial site um, not this year, four years ago. Oh. But I've always been into the spooky witch scene, so this is the first time I've ever gotten to see all this stuff. 
just so you know, if you're ever looking for a board, they sell boards here, but also there's a website called Danny Radical, R A D I K L dot com, if you don't mind me giving a plug for him. He's a friend of ours. And he does actual, he, he creates them himself. He gets like coffins, you know, coffin board and he creates them himself. So check out that website. He's actually. He's doing one for me for my film, The Afraid of Nothing documentary, cool. which is awesome. So, yeah, so check him out. So, well, thank you so much for your thank time. You. And hang yeah. out, listen if you want. But yeah. the Afraid of Nothing podcast, look for it online if you ever listen to podcasts. The Afraid of Nothing podcast. And this one will be up, by the way, probably by this time next week. So you'll, oh, be, you'll be on it. Well, thank you so much for asking. Thank you. Ah, I love it. Thank you so much. I'm obsessed with everything here right now. So. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you so much. It's yeah. funny, Bob. She mentioned... Uh, the Rick Shrek board over there. So Rick is not only the vice president of the Talking Board Historical Society, he's the brainchild for Weegezilla, which I know is something we want right, to talk that, about. Absolutely, let's, let's segue so to that. <laughs> the board that's hanging up here that he did, it's from like around 2004, and it's very dark looking. You know, it's got pentagrams, skulls. It's, people are drawn to it as one of the more evil things in the museum. Sitting right next to that board is some artwork that Rick did that are basically board rules. The, t the TBHS used those for shirts. And it's a lot of the superstitions, or as Gene from the Museum of Talking Boards would call them, Ouija-stitions that people have about the boards. You know, playing alone, don't play in the graveyard, uh, you know, always say goodbye, those kind of things. But his artwork is, is, is amazing, it's very dark. What I love about Rick is he saw the movie Witchboard, and to him, he was like, wait, that's how you open a portal? Is you have boards? So he became a collector and literally started hanging hundreds of boards around his house trying to open a portal. Uh, and so, so that, to, that those board rules, those are more of his to-do list. Most people are like, don't do these things. That's yeah. his to-do list. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, talk about Ouijazilla, that hugest board of all time. It, sure. Yeah. Ouijazilla cannot be denied. It is the world's largest talking board. Rick had the idea for this. He had done a few other pretty big projects. He, had, he owns a hearse like Danny and... He made a Ouija board that pulls out of the back and yeah. you could use it. He had done a, a board in front of his house where you could go up to like this little planchette that would light up the letters, like literally a, almost a billboard in front of his house. And eventually, Ouijazilla crossed his mind. He wanted to do the world's largest. And so uh, he spent a year hand painting 99 sheets of plywood. Each sheet was four feet by eight feet, weighed 70 pounds a piece. And he would project the image on the wall onto the board. He could never lay out more than four or five of these boards at a time to make sure that everything was lining up correctly. He worked, you know, with no air conditioning, uh, no heat. And so there's videos of him literally with a hairdryer trying to dry the paint wow. on these boards. So a full year before finally uh, we, tr we worked with Ripley's Believe It or Not. They came and filmed the packing of the, the board from New Jersey, shipping it up here to Salem. I had worked with the city to get permission, use the Salem Common. Yep. We basically spent you know, three days building the thing. None of us are construction people or whatever. Built this giant frame. We had to enlist a lot of friends to travel from pretty good distances to come out to help us with it. We were able to build it in, through some of the worst elements. You know, rain, It poured rain one day, and uh, it did. It smashed the record. It was two and a half times larger than the previous, owner, uh, wow. previous record, and, which was a, a hotel roof. So, it gives and, you so what was the square footage, you know? Uh, I forget. Off the it was nine, okay. 99 sheets of plywood, four feet by eight feet. Wow. So it's big. 99? 99. Oh, my God. It was Could nine, people walk on that? When, oh, sure. So, oh, wow. And but, you had a huge planchette. Talk about the planchette, how big plan, that was. The planchette was 400 pounds. One person could move the planchette. It was on wheels. Yeah. But we had four people kind of used it best. It was large enough to, you know, get into the center of it, the whole of it. And... Uh, it worked. I mean, we had to prove that it worked as far as you know being functional yeah. to get the record. Yeah, Rick did an amazing job with it, and uh, right now it's it's it, got, it was only up on display for about thirty hours. Yeah, a year's worth of work to go you know to build it to have it all together. It was out on display for about thirty hours before we had to pack it up, and it went back to New Jersey. And right now, the next place we're hoping it's going to go is the Denver International Airport. Years ago, we had worked with the San Francisco airport and done a display. Uh, Gene Orlando had put together a display out there, and it was well-received, so much so that the Denver International Airport wants to do it. You know, when you're walking between terminals, they have, like, these museum cases. That's so great. And then eventually they would want to put Ouijazilla on the tarmac, so when you're flying overhead, you can look down and see it. Oh, my God. And if you know anything about the Denver International Airport, there's a lot of conspiracy theories behind it as uh, it's built on top of a, a military base or yeah. some other military installation. 
Uh, there's like all sorts of like subliminal messages, like in the the, the murals there and everything. Yeah. So it's kind of the perfect place if you ever go. I was going to say the flip side. Some people would probably be very nervous about oh, that, like a, a plane so. flying over Norwegian board and says goodbye. It's like the you know? Triangle of America. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. What's going to happen? God. Uh, I should let the listeners know that John and I are, are being safe with social distancing. We're both wearing masks. We're a little muffled just because of that, but I think it's sounding good. So yeah, we're all uh, being safe here in Massachusetts, even though there's a bit of a spike. You mentioned there's a Paracon uh, in Michigan that you're going to. Uh, Michigan, you want to yeah, sure. Michigan Paracon. It was supposed to happen. They had to cancel this most recent September where most of the TBHS was going to be there. Rick yep. would be there with uh, the Ouija Planchette. And we were bringing all these, these donated boards. You know, the, like the board you you taped for the documentary and the few that are here. Well, I actually have a couple dozen donated boards from over the years. When you say donated boards, you're talking about that have backstories where people feel there's some bad stuff attached to it. Exactly. Right? So you're bringing, and, and how many roughly you bring into that? About, about two dozen of them. Wow. Well, okay. There's some. That'll be interesting, man, in terms of like the karma of people walking up and what oh, they sure. sense. But it tells a lot of different stories because some of them, you know, I collect the stories. There's a book. There's a coffee table book in that. Well, there I think. definitely yeah, is. Yeah. I mean, what people believe is is certainly a book yeah. because. So many people believe different things. Yeah. You know, but like I said, that's how the board works. It works on your belief. Yeah. And so, you know, the superstitions are those boards, but also just people's reaction to them and, and how close they want to get to them or how far away they want to stay away from them. Yeah. You know? If you ever do a book, let me know because I should be one of the chapters, you know, based on the one. Uh, I, I could track down the one that you got to the, you know, the magic parlor with my friend Rob Fitch. Okay, cool. Let's go on. Let's circle. Two more things I want to cover are the Talking Board Historical Society, which your friend Mr. Birch, I think, uh, is the president, is the president, president and yeah. founder. Yeah, let's talk about that. And then I want to talk about your music side of you. A lot of the people in the paranormal, I, and even in filmmaking, the sound people, usually the sound guy is a oh, bassist. Sure. I always find out the sound guy, oh, yeah. it never fails, you know, <laughs> on, on when I do a film. Um, but yeah, let's talk about the Talking Board Historical yeah, Society. So the TBHS is really just founded by a, a group of collectors that just all shared the same passion for this history. And it really, around the time that uh, Merch had, had discovered Elijah Bond, the person that patented the board, that we'd found out he was buried in an unmarked grave. So really the first thing was raised money to put a headstone in for him. And that kind of was like the first project that we did. And since then, you know, we've put in a headstone for Helen Peters, the person that asked the board what it wanted to be called. Was she in an unmarked grave too? Or Yeah, so her... What her is husband, with that? <laughs> well, her yeah. and her husband died so poor, they were bur buried in a friend's family plot. Oh. Oh, we knew where she was, but their names were never added to the stone. Oh. So with the other families that were there, the permission uh, they gave us permission to put in not only a headstone for them, but for Helen and her husband. Okay. And what I love about that is we tell her story, and the cemetery there embraced that history right away. They added her to prominent women of Denver tours, all the October, Halloween kind of tours, and it's a very well visited grave. It's great because that history is lost. Yeah. Like I said, it was only uncovered seven years ago, and if you look in the encyclopedia, it would tell you William Fold was the inventor and manufacturer of these boards. Helen wouldn't be listed. And so the story is slowly getting out there, especially by the cemetery embracing that history and, and wanting to teach it to people, that people can find out the real truth of where, yeah. the, Ouija board, where the Ouija name comes from. That's so awesome, because I forget, Jeff Belanger told me this one time, it's about uh, everybody has three deaths. There's a death when you die. I think the second one was the death when you're, you know, your, your family lineage ends or whatever. And then there's the third one was when people mention your name for the last time. And it's almost sure. like you've resurrected those two people, you know, Elijah oh, yeah. Wood and, and Helen Peters, because they're forgotten about, and now they're still alive, which is such a great thing, you know? Yeah, 100%. I mean, that's probably my one of my proudest things is, besides being in a group with my friends, uh, to actually do something that's going to have a longing legacy than myself, you know, leaving these headstones with these stories being told. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. So let's talk about, before we talk about the musical side of you, if people want to check out your museum or the Talking Board Historical Society or support it, uh, give us a couple of plugs or a couple of ways on how they can do that. Sure. I mean, both the groups are on Instagram. So Salem Witch Board Museum, Talking Board Historical Society, both on Instagram and Facebook. From there, they can learn whatever the next project we're doing, some of the history that we share, and... Uh, That'd be those, those would be the two best places. Is there any way they can like buy a board or provide financial support or anything like that? Or, or? Uh, the TBHS has a, a website as well you can link to that has not only merchandise for shirts and donations. And um, the Salem Witch Board Museum, I will post things for sale occasionally. I'm not, I don't use social media that way. Yeah. I have no problem shipping items or anything like that. Yeah. But uh, 
I just don't I just don't look at it that way as like this thing to sell. I have stuff in the museum to sell, and I really like to try to have as much stuff here as possible so that the guest gets the best experience. They get first shot at a lot of these rare things that I have for sale. Now that it's slowing down outside of October, now I'll be posting some things for the rest of the public. And if someone, their mother dies and they, and they get a house in the, in, the, in the attic, they find 100 Ouija boards, who should they contact? To, to uh, send talk, that to? The Talking Board Historical Society. Okay. And they can do it through, either through the webpage, through the Facebook or Instagram pages, any, any way online. And uh, I'll give them all the information they need to where they can send it and everything and start to ask the stories, you know, because, again, we like to collect the stories with these. Cool. Now let's close about you sent me one of your songs. Tell them what the, the name of the, the song is and kind of talk about your band and the music side of you. Yeah, so that song in particular is called What Does Franny Know? And that's actually about my grandmother, Frances, or Franny, as I would jokingly call her. And she's the one that sent me down the rabbit hole with these, you know. Oh, that's great. <laughs> and Ouija boards. The song is a fictional, somewhat fictional story account of her using the Ouija board, yeah. but it's based on her. But no, I've been playing music for well over 30 years. I didn't go to college after high school. I basically moved to the city, joined as many bands as I could, and at one point I was juggling as many as six bands. And for a while I, I got a reputation that I would quit my job and go on tour with bands at last minute. People, like, yeah. all of a sudden, someone couldn't go on tour because their job wouldn't allow them to. Or they'd come to me and say, hey, we're going to go away in a month. Can you learn all our songs? And Two questions. What's your favorite band that you're part of? Or is there a band that you fronted for that's like famous that you was kind of cool that you were in a concert with? There was a band that I would say is notorious. I wouldn't say uh, necessarily famous, but yeah. definitely notorious. And I've played with a lot of big bands. I've yeah. toured with quite a few. I just say go look it up yourself. You know, yeah. are you you're a humble guy? Are you uh, are you a, what what do you play? You play bass guitar? Do you play electric? Everything. Or, or, I get mostly electric guitar, but yeah. I've played bass in bands. And do you stuff. sing too, or are you just mostly? Yeah, I okay. do. That's awesome. Yeah. Do you sing on that, Franny? On that, on that no, song? that's uh, Myra. That's a okay. girl singer. Okay. Um, I do the backups on it and stuff. But okay, I, cool. Yep, yeah, I front plenty of bands. Uh, for me, I've been I've played in well over thirty bands altogether. Uh, you know, help tour. That's another bands. museum you got to set up, John. Isn't oh. it? <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, if we want to follow your music or support your music, anywhere we go for that. I know you're not a big social guy, but what if they yeah. wanted to check I mean, so out? Some of the current bands I play in are Kill Slug, uh, The Demon Seeds, Crimson Ghosts, or Evil Streaks. Those are four bands that I still play and active with right now. And what was the first one again? Kill Slug. All right, John, well, thank you so much yeah, for, no your, for your time today. What a great, we you know. You do so much to support Ouija, and uh, this is an excellent addition to Salem, which is, has so many landmarks already. So thank you for what you do, and thank you for taking the time today. I appreciate you having me on here, and thank you so much. Uh, I'm glad to be able to work with you again. It's been a while. It's been a yeah. few years since the documentary, and uh, I'm just like to have you in the museum and see for yourself. Cool, John. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bob. been listening to the afraid of nothing podcast please subscribe and like us on facebook until next time stay scared hey you're still here great then why not listen to another episode visit afraid of nothing podcast.com to peruse all the shows that's afraid of nothing podcast.com and while you're there Click the coffee cup icon to buy me a coffee and leave a review. I'll give you a shout out in an upcoming episode. And the world will know how swell you are.